Uh, good day, everyone. Of course, I'm uh, John Corstein, the Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariner's Museum. And uh, today I'm going to primarily talk about Naval African American Medal of Honor recipients. And um, and then I'm going to give a slight overview of the Army ones. Um, I did a lot of research and I found that um, most of the common information out there is incorrect. Uh, everyone says there's 25 African-American Medal of Honor winner or recipients. You're not a winner of Medal of Honor. You're a awardee or a recipient. Um, and uh, that that uh, actually someone left one out and I don't know how that happened, uh, but I got to look at all these soldier records and everything and uh, just to clarify uh, what I thought I knew. But you know, the Medal of Honor was actually established in 1862 after the Andrews Raid um, to honor soldiers and sailors who served beyond the call of duty. It, is the United States highest military decoration. Um, and, you know, how did you receive a Medal of Honor during the Civil War? Uh, well, un, you know, overwhelmingly brave acts of service. Uh, also, I would have to say, um, leadership quality, especially for African Americans, because there's going to be some circumstances where, um, you know, there are no African American officers <clears throat> in USCT regiments or uh, in the Navy. However, one African American Navy personnel will not only receive a Medal of Honor, he will also be promoted to a petty officer. Um, a, um, a signal quartermaster. So that's a, that's a huge achievement. Uh, and one way you also could get a Medal of Honor during the Civil War is capturing a flag, believe it or not, or saving your regiment's or unit's flag. Uh, that was considered highly heroic. Tom Custer, uh, during the Battle of Five Forks, actually receives two Medal of Honors for his service. And there are only so many people who do receive two Medal of Honors. Uh, during the Civil War, um, that's not true about African Americans. Um, but um, as I said, there's 26 uh, Medal of Honors that are going to be um, um, awarded to African Americans during the war. Now, eight are given to naval personnel. And Actually, the medals during the um, Civil War, there was a different Navy medal that also went to Marines. There are no African Americans in the Marines. Um, and then you see on the overs where it says exactly why this medal was awarded to the individual. And so um, it's Basically, when you go back through their records, it's really highly documented. And of course, this is our first one. Uh, now, I have to tell you, the U.S. Navy um, went back and um, did these paintings um, about some of the African American Medal of Honor recipients. They did so because... Um, you know, it was the time in the 70s, the time of reconciliation and so forth uh, within the military. And uh, so there are only so many photographs of these recipients. And so they went and did these sketches uh, behind a, a perceived image of the recipient in question, like Aaron Anderson. I'm going to have to tell you that there are no Gatling guns on ships during the Civil War. So this is somewhat fanciful, but nevertheless, it's trying to bring pride into the Navy, uh, African-Americans who are serving in the Navy. Also, I want to note that it is not the Congressional Medal of Honor. It is the 
Medal of Honor. And so um, you, there's all these misconceptions. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I'll tell you, Aaron Anderson is one who uh, is awarded his medal at the very end of the war. Um, we uh, actually is involved in this small boat engagement at Maddox Creek, Virginia, because believe it or not, the U.S. Potomac's flotilla is guarding the Potomac River against smuggling or blockade running from Southern Maryland into Virginia. And this was a big business um, and the U.S. Navy wanted to stop it. So on now he's going to be assigned uh, to this boat known as the Wyadank and uh, which is actually built in um, back in 1847 and uh, you can see it right um, over to the left <clears throat> and this is at the Naval Academy this is post-war it was a store ship um, that um, was supporting the flotilla now I have to tell you uh, there's a launch that's um, launched or a cutter that's launched from the USS Don, a small gunboat, and they're it's except volunteers. And one of those volunteers is going to be landsman Aaron Anderson. Now, he is going to uh, be rowing in the uh, cutter and he, as his Medal of Honor, um, now what happens, they go, the, the Maddox Creek branches, so they go up the right side of the creek where they see some small boats, they will um, destroy them, and then as they come back, they decided to investigate the left branch of the creek, Maddox Creek. And the left branch is where the Confederates are laying in ambush because um, Ensign Summer, who is the commander of this cutter, sees these three schooners anchored along the um, shore. And so he wants to go and burn them. So Anderson, remember he's rowing, uh, according to Summer, who writes this citation, carried out his duties courageously in face of a desert desafacing fire, which cut away half the oars, pierced the launch in many places, cut the barrel off of a musket being fired at the enemy. The citation goes on to note that he's rowing while the musket that's shot out of the arms is out of the arms of Sumner, Sumter, uh, Summer itself, and while the other people are bailing because they have holes in their ships, there are no casualties, which is amazing. There are 400 Confederates. Now, I got to tell you, um, they have a boat howitzer, and that's the boat howitzer that's designed by uh, Dahlgren, and uh, uh, so they um, use that boat howitzer. Now, when they destroy the three schooners, they use incendiary devices, which are not really explained, but actually uh, they did have um, the idea of something like Molotov cocktails, actually Blackbeard used those types of things, and small hand grenades, or just torches. So it's not explained in the official records how they burn those ships, but they do have this boat howitzer. So uh, basically, um, the boat howitzer is manned by boatswain's mate, Patrick Mullen. And in this engagement, after they burn the schooners, they then recognize where the Confederates have their ambush and so they move the cutter towards the Confederates and Mullins calmly. Now, remember, we're under fire. We're rowing only half the oars. Um, we're bailing. The boat could be sinking at any time. And so Mullins bravely stands up in the boat and fires his um, howitzer 
He fires two shells, the Confederates disperse, and then they go back uh, to the Wankadank. And uh, so on that day, March 17, 1865, both boatswain's mate, Patrick Mullen, who is a Caucasian um, and actually an Irishman, um, and, uh, and Aaron Anderson, an African-American, um, will receive um, a, a Medal of Honor. And they actually receive it shortly after the event. Now, what happens with Medal of Honors, as we're going to learn, is that uh, um, you could... Um, you could apply for one as late as the 1890s. And in fact, it was a big push to have all sorts of people get Medal of Honors, uh, political positions and so forth, help prompt their awards. How are there many that receive them um, right away? And the next one I wanna talk about is going to be ordinary seaman, Robert Blake. And Robert Blake, uh, there's another one. This is a little closer to the action because that kind of looks like a Dahlgren shell gun. And uh, so Robert Blake was born enslaved in Virginia, was later sold to a plantation, a large plantation on the uh, Santee River in South Carolina. As the Union gunboats patrolled these rivers, they actually will, and, and this plantation has, um, according um, records, has over 400 slaves and rice production. And so, uh, which was a big production out of South Carolina at that time. And so what will transpire is that uh, uh, Blake uh, becomes a contraband and uh, he will enlist in the U.S. Navy, because the Navy um, at the very, well, the Navy has always had, uh, was always colorblind. In other words, they're African-American sailors that serve in the Revolutionary War, War of 1812, Mexican War. It's averaged to be about 10% during the Civil War. The percentage is a little higher, um, probably about 14%. Um, and uh, so, uh, Blake will join the Navy because the Navy always needs more recruits. And as a result of that, uh, he will be assigned to the USS Vermont. And then he will be assigned to the Amadilla class gunboat, the USS Marblehead, which we see before us right now. Now, I got to tell you, the Vermont, Vermont has its own great story, because after the War of 1812, we said we need ships of the line. So they lay down this vessel in 1818. They never finish it until 1848. And then they don't decide to commission it till 1861. And it becomes a store ship, a hospital ship, um, and actually um, very, several noted uh, um, officers and like John Worden will actually be in the uh, Vermont sick bay at Port Royal Sound. But Blake wants action, and so he will be reassigned to the Marblehead. The Marblehead is going to be armed with one 11 inch Dahlgren and two 24 pounder smoothbores and two 24 pounder rifles. And so an expedition is going to be sent up um, the Stono River, um, which is behind James Island. And if you know the topography of um, Charleston Harbor, uh, this river comes behind it. So they're going up the river to um, actually, there was rumors, there was Confederate position. The Federals at that time, the soldiers, are putting pilings or obstructions off of James Island to protect their camp that they have created there. Now, um, the command of the Marblehead is going to be Lieutenant Commander Richard Worsham Meade. And uh, that's M-E-A-D. Um, and so when the Confederates open fire, believe it or not, Meade is you know, sleeping. 
right? Now, um, it just so happens that Blake is going to be his steward. Um, and so uh, the sound of the cannon wakes everybody up. Blake, uh, as you know, Mead runs up in his, un, you know, his nightshirt. And so Mead chases, or uh, Blake chases after him to give him, put on his uniform, you know, have some dignity here, sir. And then when he's on the deck, a shell explodes right next to the 11 inch Dahlgren, uh, killing uh, several people, including the powder monkey. Now, it just so happens that Blake then replaces the powder monkey through the action and will deliver powder and shot to the gun crew while under heavy fire by the Confederates. Now, it just so happens that uh, Meade says, what are you doing? You know, because he's a steward. He doesn't have to be actively in battle. And uh, according uh, to Meade, Blake responds, I went down to the rocks to hide my face, but the rocks said there is no hiding here, so here I am, sir. Well, Meade is going to nominate Blake for a Medal of Honor, and his citation reads, serving the gun, Blake, an escaped slave, carry out duties bravely throughout the engagement, which resulted in the enemy's abandonment of positions, leaving a caisson and one gun behind. Blake was promoted to ordinary seaman and served another enlistment in the U.S. Navy. Sadly, there's no other record of his life. Now, we're going to get to where several Medal of Honors are going to be awarded to, a conf uh, to African Americans. Um, and it's going to be at the Battle of Mobile Bay on August 5th, 1864. Now, um, on board this ship is going to be Landsman William H. Brown. He was born free in Baltimore, Maryland in 1836. He joined the Navy on March 23, 1862, uh, and was immediately assigned to the Brooklyn, which is a steam screw sloop that has 29-inch Dahlgrens and one 10-inch pivot gun. The sloop is going to be commanded by J Captain James Alden, Jr., and in the battle line, going into Mobile Bay's entrance, past Fort Morgan, he is going to come, uh, the, the ship is going to become under fire. So there are two rows, actually. One is a row of wooden ships, wooden steamers. The other interior row, closer to the fort, is the ironclads that Farragut had assembled. Well, I got to tell you, um, as Alden is bringing his ship in, all of a sudden he witnesses the explosion that sinks the Tecumseh. Alden stops his vessel because he sees these buoys right under his bow and you know torpedoes ahead. Well, this prompts uh, this stops the entire line. So in other words, they're under shell fire. They're a stationary target within uh, 700 yards of Fort Morgan. So they are peppered or struck with numerous shells. And of course, Farragut is going to say, uh, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Um, and this looks like he's in a monitor, but he's not. Um, and uh, uh, so that's when uh, Farragut says, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. The Brooklyn suffered heavily, 40, uh, 54 casualties. And Mifflin, James Mifflin, um, who's a landsman, uh, will um, actually... <clears throat> be stationed in the immediate vicinity of the shell whips. And a shell whip, you see, you keep your boxes of gunpowder and shells on the berth deck, which is right below the shell of gun deck on a uh, 
screw sloop, the Hartford class screw sloops. So a whip is a device that helps bring the gunpowder up to the deck when then it's going to be transferred towards the gun. So um, now uh, basically he's right there at the shell whip and um, um, basically a Confederate shell from Fort Morgan explodes, knocking everybody down, killing four of the six men operating the shell whip. Now, Brown, despite being knocked down and having a mortally wounded person fall on him, he throws him off of him and keeps operating the shell whip. And he performed his duties in the powder division throughout the furious action, which resulted in the surrender of the prize Rebel Ram Tennessee and in damaging and destruction of batteries at Fort Morgan. Well, a total of 23 people will receive the Medal of Honor during the Battle of Mobile Bay. There's actually going to be another African-American um, that is uh, going to receive it on board the Brooklyn. Now, this, this, this is the scene I'm talking about. There is the Brooklyn, right? And this is the torpedo field right there. Oh my gosh, look what's happening. Um, you're seeing that uh, the Tecumseh is, hits the mine. The white is not a shot fired by the Brooklyn. It's the Brooklyn being struck by that very shell that we talked about. So um, this is a dangerous position to be in. And uh, so basically working with Landsman William H. Brown is going to be engineers Cook James Mifflin. Now, you know, he's the cook for the engineering staff. Back there in the Navy, you know, the engineers were kind of looked down upon. And so they had their own um, ranking and so forth versus regular line uh, members of the Navy. Uh, so, Anyway, uh, during the battle, um, actually, Mifflin will be with Brown when that shell explodes. <clears throat> he is going to be wounded, and as he's wounded, instead of going below, he stays at his post and continues working the shell whip with Brown. So that's pretty amazing. Um, now, um, we also um, have others that are going to serve during the Battle of Mobile Bay, African Americans on board the Hartford. And one of them is this man, Wilson Brown, who was enslaved on Botany Bay Plantation near Natchez, Mississippi in 1841. You know, when the U.S. Navy is operating in the Mississippi River, uh, he becomes a contraband, goes and joins the, the crew of the Hartford. And um, he also was working the shell whip on the um, Hartford. And this is what his uh, citation says. Knocked unconscious into the hole of the ship when an enemy shell burst fatally wounded a man in the ladder above. Brown, upon regaining consciousness, promptly returned to the shell whip on the berth deck and ze zealously continued to perform his duty, although four of the other men uh, four of the six working the shell whip, just like what happened on the Brooklyn. Um, he uh, keeps his station and um, uh, to, under terrific fire. Um, now, Wilson Brown's going to return to Natchez after the war, where he will live in um, uh, Natchez. Um, so, and he lives till 1900. Now, of course, this is the famous uh, USS Hartford. Um, now, this is another crew member of the 
um, uh, Hartford, and this is John H. Lawson. Uh, there is his Medal of Honor right there on his chest. Uh, Lawson was born a free black in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He listed in the U.S. Navy in December of 1863, and he's going to also be with that shell whip now. I have to tell you, uh, his citation reads, on board the flagship USS Hartford during the successful attacks against Fort Morgan, rebel gunboats, and the Ram Tennessee in Mobile Bay on 5 August 1864, wounded in the leg and thrown violently against the side of the ship when an enemy shell whipped onto the shell deck, um, on the berth deck, excuse me, um, Lawson, upon retaining his composure, will promptly return to his station, and although urged to go below for treatment, he steadfastly continued his duties throughout the remainder of the action. And I have to tell you, it was quite a fierce action. And uh, uh, so Lawson is uh, uh, going to uh, continue, he lives till 1919. He actually becomes what is called, a, and this is in his wife's pension request that her husband was Medal of Honor recipient, served on the USS Hartford, um, and uh, that, oh my gosh, um, his occupation after the war was listed as being a huckster. Now, I know what a huckster is, a uh, scammer, so forth, but then when I looked it up in a 19th century dictionary, uh, you know, I'm one of those people that have those, um, it's described as being a peddler of small trinkets. And in essence, he went out on the streets with his Medal of Honor, right? And we're selling little doodads and so forth to people along the street, uh, showing he was a proud veteran. And also he has some pretty neat little things, the goo gads uh, or doodads and so forth. Now, so uh, this is the Battle of Mobile Bay. Now, this is not the shot that hits the shell whip, I do not think. But why I like this image so much is you see all the scene around you. Um, there is the cannon that caused that shell uh, to hit onto the deck. Um, and uh, that is um, so. But what's the most important is there is an African-American uh, falsely called uh, Joachim uh, Pease, but he's actually, we don't know his name, but there he is as a gun loader at, uh, during the Battle of Mobile Bay. You can see that man lost his foot. Um, you can see the powder monkey rushing um, from getting the gunpowder up from what? The shell whip. Uh, that prompted Lawson to win or receive his Medal of Honor. Now, one of my, I think my, one of my favorite stories about these African-American Medal of Honor recipients is going to be Signal Quartermaster Thomas English. English was a free African-American um, who actually, now there's some records that are confusing, but he is going to join the crew of this ship, which is the new Ironsides, which is um, commanded by uh, Commodore Thomas Turner. Um, he, this ship is just like the La Gare, which is a French uh, warship. Um, new Ironsides had an armor belt of 4.5 inches. It has, it's armed with 14 nine, 11 inch Dahlgren guns, two 150 pounder Parrot rifles and two 50 pounder Dahlgren rifles. We're gonna get you if you come close to this ship. English was part of a crew of 449 officers and men. 
And um, I have to say that he is considered to be the highest ranking African-American during uh, the Civil War because his rating is signal master, or sing single quartermaster. And so um, during the second, first and second battles of Fort Fisher, this ship is going to be having close in fires, um, in flailing fire onto Fort Fisher. And um, in the second battle, it is a fierce artillery barrage, as well as return fire from the Confederate Fort Fisher. So um, basically, uh, English is going to be in the pilot house with the pilot, the captain, and then when, because it's a flagship, Admiral Porter's there during, it's the, during the engagement, it's the flagship, he will send English out to, you see, it's got mass, and so what do you hang from those masts? Signal flags, and so it is English, Thomas English's duty to change those flags as they're sending orders to the rest of the fleet. And so, as they said, that uh, um, during the Fort Fisher attacks, his heroic actions caused him to repeatedly and with composure leave the safety of the armored pilot house to change the signal flags vital to communications during a storm of shot and shell. As a result of these, he is going to receive the Medal of Honor and his award is actually going to be given on 22 June 1865 after the war English you know, a signal quartermaster stays in the U.S. Navy and he's going to be assigned to the screw sloop uh, Piscataqua um, and, uh, and actually, which is assigned to the Asiatic Station. Now, sadly, English will die of unknown causes on board the ship off Singapore and was buried at sea. And yet this, my friends, is the obverse of his Medal of Honor um, that he um, receives. Okay, here is Joachim Joachim Pease. I don't know why I always have trouble with that name. Uh, there are no rapid fire guns in the battle he's going to serve on because he's going to be at the battle the, of the Kearsarge and the Alabama. He was actually a native of Fago Island uh, within the Cape Verde Island group. And his family later moved to New Bedford, Massachusetts. And he enlisted in the Navy on 12 January, 1862. And he was immediately signed to the Mohican class sloop of war, the USS Kearsarge. Now we know all about the Kearsarge because it jo its job was trying to find various um, Confederate commerce raiders. It will block the CSS uh, some Sumter from escaping Gibraltar, which leads to Raphael Sems uh, just selling the ship and then ending up as commander of the CSS um, Alabama. Now we all know about the Alabama, it's great cruise. And so what's going to happen is that ordinary seamen, so his family had been seamen. So actually most African-Americans who join the Navy will get ranks of landsman, uh, also ship's boy. Um, and uh, uh, those are the lowest ranks in the US Navy because they have no ship experience. 
So when we say ordinary seaman, that means he does have sailing experience. And so basically, uh, Pease, during the battle, remember the battle, uh, gosh, what happens that they actually um, exchanged notes between uh, Captain Winslow and Captain Sims, very polite. Oh yes, I'll be out there to meet you and I'll be there too. And so basically Pease is assigned to gun number two as the loader. So just to show you that's what he's doing, because you can see uh, that's the shell loader tool. So that's what Pease is doing during this battle. Now, uh, he actually, this is the deck of the Kearsarge right around the time of the sinking of the Alabama. You can see one African-American forward, um, and I really can't make out any others, but um, that man definitely is and could be. We don't know Pease. But anyway, he is the loader of gun number two during this bitter engagement. Pease exhibited marked coolness and good conduct and was highly recommended for gallantry under fire. Wow. Why did these, I'm going to, why did these men actually serve? Many African Americans served with distinction through the war, continuously demonstrating um, their skill and bravery, bravery during numerous engagements. During the March 8th to 9, 1862 Battle of Hampton Roads, 16 African Americans made up the entire gun crew of the uh, USS Minnesota's AF pivot gun. The Minnesota's commander after the battle it will write, he praised his gun crew, uh, this is actually before the Medal of Honor had been established. So he praises them. And uh, of course, the commander, Captain uh, Gorshan Jacques Henry Van Brunt, I love that name. Uh, he will say, or write in the official records, the Negroes fought energetically and bravery, none more so. They evidently felt that they were thus working out the deliverance of their race. Oh my gosh, you know, that is, um, uh, you know, amazing. Now, I want to tell you what makes the Medal of Honor so important. Because back in the old days, like in the War of 1812, like Stephen Decatur, oh my gosh, he captures a ship. What does Congress do? We give him a gold medal and we give him prize money and we give him a fancy gold or silver sword, depending on who you are. Well, what does that all mean? It means that they had um, um, created a, uh, an amazing, uh, it was a very simple way. Many enlisted men did not receive such honors. So because of what the Civil War is like, they find that it's very necessary uh, to offer forth this Medal of Honor. Now, as I told you, there are 26 Medal of Honor recipients, eight in the Navy, but there's going to be another 18 African Americans who receive the Medal of Honor uh, during um, their duty in four different engagements. This is the first one um, who actions will receive a Medal of Honor. But I got to tell you, uh, he is not the first one to get the Medal of Honor. His actions are the first to warrant a Medal of Honor, but he does not receive his until 1900. Oh my gosh, there he is wearing it. He's head of the Postal Union Workers uh, or the Postal Workers Union because um, he was a postal worker after the war. He receives it in 1900 like so many others do. Actually, they took away, gave back Medal of Honors. It was kind of crazy. They actually give some to a woman that they take back. She says, no way, I'm going to still wear it. And so Carney, of course, uh, was born in Norfolk, Virginia. 
you can go at the intersection of Princess Anne and Granby Street, and there is a monument that's raised to African-American soldiers, but the likeness is that of William Harvey Carney. Now, he was born in Norfolk, but his family, now some say he was born a slave, some people say he was born free. His, some of his family we knew were freed by the slave owner and also during the slave owner's or the enslaver's life, as well as through his will. Nevertheless, the family moves up to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he's going to enlist in the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Regiment. Oh my gosh, this is you know that regiment commanded by uh, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw. It is a, a you know they're a unit because of Shaw that wants to prove that these African-Americans can actually be soldiers on the battlefield. It's trying to dispel all these terrible myths. Well, so when Shaw leads them in attack against Fort Wagner, which is on Morris Island, generally it's called Battery Wagner, but the Federals all call it Fort Wagner. So this is the second battle of Fort Wagner on July 18, 1863. And of course, the unit under shot and shell and vicious musket fire, they make it to the parapet crossing through the abate, uh, pointy sticks, um, they will actually barely reach the parapet when a Shaw is killed. The color bearer, right? That's the most important thing. Remember when you might have been a kid and you played capture the flag? Well, that's all based back to the Civil War. You got to capture the enemy's flag because flags were so important, showing you where to go and what have you. Well, when Carney sees this, despite being severely wounded, um, he will, as the color bearer falls to the ground, Carney will grab the flag and retreat with the, what remains of the 54th um, Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment. After the battle, he um, proudly tells people, boys, I only did my duty and the old flag never touched the ground. Whoa. Now, as I told you, uh, he doesn't get his medal until uh, 1900. That makes Robert Blake, who we talked about earlier, the first one because of the date when he received the medal. Now, I have to tell you um, that, uh, and, and Blake also gets promoted to ordinary seaman because of this award. So, um, and Blake's actions near Legarville, South Carolina was pretty amazing. Now, there are several other awardees in other individual battles. Corporal Decatur Dorsey received his medal during the 30 July 1864 Battle of the Crater. Now, um, this is a very controversial battle, and what I'm going to be doing is doing um, next February, I'm going to be doing the Army version, but I just want to give you a little smidget of it today. And, uh, and also, I'm going to expand the blog I wrote to include these 18 people. Uh, you have to be very thorough on this type of research, uh, just because there's some misnomers out there. Um, so anyway, um, Decatur Dorsey received his medal during the 30th July, 1864, Battle of the Crater. He is one of those African-American units that were trained to go around the crater, but instead they were replaced as the lead units. White soldiers go right down in the crater, the African-Americans follow, and then they're struck by a vicious counterattack led by uh, William Mahone, a Confederate general. And so um, he was conspicuously brave uh, in that action. Uh, so uh, there's Shaw being killed. There's the flag. We don't think that is Carney yet. Um, and so you can just see, this is a Kurtz and Allison 
pick. So everyone looks clean, everything, but it wasn't that way as you pretty well figure. Um, and so anyway, the next one was Corporal Andrew Jackson Smith, who re was awarded his Medal of Honor during the 30 November 1864 Battle of Honey Hill. There are three small battles during Sherman's March to the Sea, because remember, William Hardy, uh, Lieutenant General William Hardy, is using state troops and whatever, along with Gustavus Woodson Smith, uh, to delay the advance of Sherman's army in his march to the sea. And so, um, uh, Andrew Jackson Smith is going to be awarded the Medal of Honor shortly thereafter. Now, there's also another African-American who receives the Medal of Honor, uh, one of two during the Battle of Fort Fisher. We already mentioned one who's a Navy, uh, a member of the Navy, uh, a Signal Quartermaster. Uh, this person is a private, Private Bruce Anderson of the 142nd New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Now, I gotta tell you, there's uh, just to, not to avoid some confusion, uh, when different states have volunteer regiments, they're trying to get around the um, federal law that no African Americans can serve. Um, so they muster their own African American regiments with white officers. There's you know Colonel Shaw being killed, um, and so. Uh, basically, uh, then when they recruit regular units, they are often called United States Colored Infantry, United States Covered Colored Light Artillery, United States Colored uh, Cavalry. But they're all lumped under what is known as United States Colored Troops, USCT. And so um, uh, Anderson at the Battle of Fort Fisher will actually go forward with an ax, knocking down part of the palisade that's guarding or the outer works of Fort Fisher. However, I want to tell you the most important battle when it comes to awards of Medal of Honors will be the Battle of Chaffin's Farm, which is fought between 29 and 30 September, 1864. Benjamin Franklin Butler, who's commander of the Army of the James, takes his command and will actually, um, you know, try to attack Richmond uh, during the siege of Petersburg at the un soft underbelly of Richmond. Now, this is where um, Butler wants to really use his Black troops to prove their value in combat. And so the broad searchlight of valor shined upon many African-American members of the Army of the James during their valiant assault against um, New Market Heights. Because the Battle of Chaffin's Farm is also called the Battle of Fort Harrison. It's also called the Battle of Chaffin's Bluff. It's also called Chaffin's Farm. You know, no one can really decide. The medals that these people receive all says Chaffin's Bluff. Now, let me tell you about this man. This is Powhatan Beatty, uh, Beatty and uh, he took command of his company. All the officers have been killed or wounded and gallantly led it. <clears throat> I got to tell you, um, he is an enlisted man who has to take over. He is a first sergeant. And because everyone is killed, you can see. Now, what's great about this picture, and I'm going to mention this just a bit, the first medal to the, the medal to the left is the Medal of Honor. Um, the one to the right is the Butler's Medal. And I'll get to that in just a bit. Now, also another person, uh, and you can see um, Palatan um, uh, Beatty is actually uh, going to be um, actually moving um, against this unit right here. Um, and so this is actually Newmarket Heights, uh, Chaffin's 
Bluff is right down here. So, um, and Fort Harrison is going to be back over here. So the battle is actually going to move like this. So you, you got to realize that one of the recipients is this man, Dan, James Daniel Gardner. Now, I got to tell you, he's a member of the 36 USCT mustered here on the peninsula. He's originally from York County, and um, he will, um, um, of course, this is a, a monument for him at Gloucester, uh, excuse I said York County, he's from Gloucester County, and this is a monument at the courthouse honoring him that was put in uh, 14 years ago, but there's actually an image of Gardner uh, because his Medal of Honor uh, citation says, rushed in advance of his brigade, shot a rebel officer who was on the parapet rallying his men and then ran him through with his bayonet. Oh my gosh. And that becomes a popular print, which we'll see in the next blog. Now I have to tell you, uh, there are several, there are 12 others that received the Medal of Honor at uh, Chaffin's Bluff. I'm just gonna mention them. Private William H. Barnes of the 38th uh, USCT, First Sergeant James H. Bronson of the 5th USCT, Sergeant Major Christian Fleetwood of the 4th USCT, um, Sergeant James H. Harris of the 38th um, uh, USCT, who is the only one of those Medal of Honor recipients to be killed in action. There is a Private Thomas Harkins, and his record actually is real confusing because it says he received his medal of honor uh, uh, during the 21st July 1864 Battle of Deep Bottom. But when you look at his medal in the obverse, it says Chaffin's Farm. And I'll have a picture of that for you next time. And others included Alfred uh, B. Hilton of the 4th USCT, Sergeant Major Milton Holland, the 5th USCT, uh, Corporal Miles James of the 36th USCT, First Sergeant Alexander Kelly of the 6th USCT, and First Sergeant Robert Penn of the US, 5th USCT, and Private Charles Veal of the 4th USCT. Now, I have to tell y'all that these people um, at the Battle of Chaffin's Bluff, Ben Butler is looking towards the aftermath of the Civil War, trying to prove the value of African Americans to society and how they should be recognized as people as equal to white soldiers or white anyone. So this is a real big thing. In fact, Butler was so impressed. If we look at uh, POW debates, there's that medal right there. It is called the Colored Soldiers Medal or commonly known as the um, Butler Medal. He minted a uh, coin silver a hunt on his own expense. Of course, he stole so much silver during the war that it was okay for him to melt that down. Um, and that's another story, which I'll get to one of these days. But he mints this medal and gives to 199 members of the Army of the James, who were also heroic, but not quite to the level of the Medal of Honor. Why Powhatan Beatty received both, I am unsure, um, but uh, um, I uh, actually, the Virginia War Museum, not far from here, um, when I was director, we acquired one of those um, uh, Butler medals, as they're commonly called. It's, it's unbelievably fabulous. It's really fabulous to learn these stories of uh, the soldiers that served these African-Americans who went beyond the call of duty and did so under prejudice. But by doing so, they proved themselves equal to any. Well, 
So if you got any questions, now the time to ask. If you want to just write me, I'm John Corstein at gmail.com. Happy to answer yours. I got actually have a backlog of about 15 questions I have to answer. But, uh, you know, I, I, I write too much and, you know, so blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, that's me thinking about my next blog. Okay. So anyway, uh, Julie, do I have questions? Yes, we do. Hi, I'm Julie Murphy with, with the Mariners Museum. My pleasure to, to work with John on this and, and many other programs for the museum. Um, we do have a couple of questions today. I'm asking mine first. The 54th, was that? the movie glory, glory that I yes so much. It, it was okay it was and actually um william carney is depicted by denzel washington right because during the thing he picks up the flag mm -hmm. but um we know that um uh, we do not believe that um um uh, carney was whipped to that extent that was shown in the the film and he was not, um, Carney was not a field hand. He lived in Norfolk. He was a house servant. And his father definitely was a fugitive slave uh, uh, and maybe Carney, but the rest of the family would be manumitted by their owner. And they joined the family in New Bedford where they work as watermen. Elpidio, and I may have mispronounced that, I'm sorry if I did, um, is asking, were any of these men from Tidewater, are any of them buried in the Tidewater area? So you, you oh, sure. on that. Oh, um, sure. Uh, Gardner is buried in Gloucester. Um, um, uh, there are several USCT members that are buried like on the Yorktown Naval Weapons Station in Newport News at the First Baptist Church, Campbell Road. There's actually a Civil War Trails marker there honoring those men. Um, and so, yes, they're, they're um, actually, if you go into the graveyard um, near Fort Harrison, several USCT members, including Medal of Honor recipient Brian, who I said was killed in action, are buried there. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. it's a really amazing, a classic, um, you know, US battlefield, a uh, post-Civil War. Um, and so he's in there. Uh, so yes, I think um, far much more research needs to be done to identify where the, uh, and I know that where some people are buried, like, um, um, uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he went back home to Nashville. Oh, Lawson, he went back home. And what did he do? He gets buried in the Nashville cemetery. So I could do a little tracking and answer where some of these Medal of Honors uh, people, we know um, that uh, English, is buried at sea and mm -hmm. uh, so but some people just disappear whether they change their name like sia carter reverted to his non-slave name um so uh, many people just disappear and which is a shame mm -hmm. others like Beatty, i gotta tell you he is a leading african-american actor in the post-civil war era he actually performs at ford's theater in the 1870s he's an actor before the war and he continues his acting career but that acting gave him a leadership role which he assumed during the battle of chaffin's farm next marie asks can you go on the property at the naval weapons station to see the grave no. Um, and um, I mean, it would take um, presidential order, um, you know, what have you. You know, my father was an officer in the army when I was in uh, school and a bunch of friends and I 
you know, decided, oh, let's go on Camp Perry, you know, who, you know, we got ID cards and they told us to turn around. <laughs> yeah. You know, we had kind of long hair. I thought it was always funny when I went on Fort Monroe, uh, you know, they'd have to salute my car because of the sticker, not because I had long blonde hair, believe it or not, <laughs> because it was summertime, uh, lifeguard, that sort of stuff. But anyway, um, you can see Gardner's Memorial in Gloucester Courthouse. And that's the closest one. And you can and go Carney, see right? and Carney over in, I can't remember the name of the cemetery right now, but it, it is very visible from the street. Mm -hmm. I actually filmed a, um, uh, my here and then PBS series at that monument explaining how the African-American community, when the Caucasian community builds that huge monument, they said, we're gonna build our own monument. And, and really all soldiers from the war, black and white, it doesn't matter, Union, Confederate, um, they all need to be honored in, the, in, in appropriate manners because they did stand up during one of the times when the greatest burdens of American history is laid upon them. And some of them served beyond the call of duty. One last question for us today. And if any others come up, feel free to email John at johnforstein at gmail.com. But the last- yeah, We're on question, a short timeline today. We are, and sorry for that. But this um, viewer asked, and I think think you answered, were actions early in the war eligible for Medal of Honor recognition or only actions performed after the Medal of Honor was created? There are no people who are awarded the Medal of Honor who were serving before the uh, medal was created to honor the Andrews Raid uh, members. Uh, remember, they stole a train down in uh, South Carolina or, or Georgia, there actually was a Walt Disney program about it. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and so, yes, um, it's actually after they established the medal that then people start receiving it. And commonly it's after 1863. Um, and um, the, the, just the Medal of Honor has a unique story and um, I will obviously um, next year uh, tell you far more about, especially the men at uh, Newmarket Heights. It's, it's unbelievable, mm -hmm. all their citations and then actually reading, of, learning about their companies and how, you know, and, and looking at their images. We have an image of several members of uh, several Medal of Honor recipients from uh, the uh, Army of the James. And uh, it's, it's an interesting perspective to see who they were, where they came from, and what they did after the war. And generally, we, they, they tried to track these people, not like they do today, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it is all about um, honoring those who served. So anyway, I want to thank you all for being with me today. Um, and I think that when we look at the Civil War, we have to realize that every type of American served, whether you are a Native American, an African American, an Irishman, a Pole, a German, uh, and some of them had their own units. So uh, the melting pot of America, um, and, and I like to remind people, there are numerous Hispanic um, people serving in the Civil War, or Civil War, the highest ranking I mentioned today, and his name was Admiral David Glasgow Farragut, mm -hmm. whose father was born in Mallorca. So, you know, go get that. And we oftentimes don't really look at these various units and how uh, there's some German units that couldn't speak English, you know, and I got 
great story. Mm -hmm. Whenever I do my big Bethel program for you all, I will include that. So anyway, um, I want to thank you all. And uh, I hope that um, you have a, uh, a wonderful uh, rest of February. Uh, I get my second COVID shot next week. <laughs> I feel so empowered. I was thinking about taking a road trip just to drive around where I haven't been. And then I decided I'm too busy, <laughs> you know, writing. So uh, anyway. Um, well, Don, I wanted to, to let people know that March 5th at lunchtime, <sighs> take the afternoon off because it's going to be about drinking on the monitor. What role alcohol played in the Civil War Navy, and it's it's one of our favorite subjects, isn't it, John? I, I just want to remind you all that on the morning of March 9th, the crew of the CSS Virginia um, for breakfast were given two boiled eggs and two jiggers of whiskey. Oh my gosh, you know, so it's a fun story. Yeah. I'm going to have my gill of grog while I give it. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm not. But uh, anyway, uh, it is a uh, tremendous, it's got humor, it's got sadness, it's got incompetence. Um, but uh, <laughs> drinking in the war was ever so commonplace. And then when they tried to stop it, ha ha, there is ways to get around it. So uh, anyway, we got a lot of drunks on the monitor, so we'll talk about them and others. So anyway, without further ado, uh, peace to you all. Take, take it safe. And I look forward to um, seeing you all again uh, in, on March um, what? Um, March, 5th. March 5th. Yes. Yep. OK, thank and you. We, we look forward to having you come back to, to visit with us, all you viewers. And thank you, John, for a great program, as always. And Thank you. have a great weekend, all. Thank you. Thank you.